Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, final uh, session or final panel session, I should say. Um, we've had a lot of uh, chat over the last couple of days on uh, all things investment um, and some in-depth looks from McKinsey and Gil this morning at Jefferies on the uh, US investor landscape. Um, IPOs, SPACs, things like that. We have a US focus for, for the rest of today as well, um, starting off with our panel, um, which I'll introduce shortly, uh, and then a presentation on Iowa's One Health uh, <laughs> sector and the opportunities for European companies uh, following shortly afterwards. Um, but yeah, delighted to have a panel of um, leading investors from across the US uh, joining us to um, delve into what the next phase of US healthcare investment is going to look like, what have we seen and where are we going. Um, guiding us through this afternoon um, is Bill Hicks with Mints. Um, so without further ado, Bill, over to you. Hi, I'm Bill Hicks at Mints 11. Um, I'm the co-chair of our securities and capital markets practice. I work with uh, biotech companies, um, biotech focus investment banks, as well as um, investors. Um, um, Steve, could you um, introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Steve Toll. I'm a partner at HLM Venture Partners here in Boston. Uh, we're probably the oldest venture firm in the U.S. that focuses exclusively in healthcare. We've been doing that for 30 years. And we focus in areas of digital health, uh, behavioral health, telehealth, and tech-enabled services. Stephanie. Thanks, Bill. Hi, I'm Stephanie Sirota. I'm a partner at RTW Investments. We are headquartered in New York City. We're a six and a half billion dollar full life cycle fund um, that focuses entirely on life sciences, both therapeutics as well as uh, med tech. And uh, we do everything from incubate, you know, assets and create new companies. Uh, we're very involved in the early and mid stage venture. A uh, lot of work on the capital markets and crossover and IPOs, um, and then also have a public public book. Um, we've got hedge fund vehicles as well as a listed vehicle that trades on the London Stock Exchange. Scott, thanks, Bill. I'm Scott Plachon. I'm a partner at EcoR1 Capital. We're a investment fund based in San Francisco. The fund was founded in 2013. We are really um, exclusively focused on therapeutics. And aside from company creation, we really play at all stages in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So I split my time about 50-50 between public and private companies. Um, and we really just focus on finding great science and great entrepreneurs. Uh, so thanks for including me. Looking forward to the discussion. Travis. Hi, thanks for including me here. Uh, Travis Murdoch, I'm a partner at Monograph Capital. Um, Monograph is a, is a relatively new fund that's focused both on opportunities in Europe and the UK as well as in the US. So we have offices both in London, central London, as well as in San Francisco. <clears throat> our, our focus you know, is in part on therapeutics, but also on diagnostics tools and services companies. Um, we're, we're spanning both company creation. I'm currently CEO of a company we're incubating focused on precision immunology but also um, uh, stage agnostic in terms of the investments we make. So we'll play all the way into crossover and, and potentially in the public markets. Great. So this has been a, a very um, crazy time. Um, I'd say the IPO markets have been crazy. The SPAC markets were crazier. Um, the SPACs clearly have slowed down. Um, IPOs, we're hearing it. Um, just generally, you know, what, do, what are you guys seeing for 2022? Are we going to see things slow down in the IPO market or do you think they're going to keep chugging? I'll start with you, Stephanie. Yeah, I, th I think um, I think things are going to keep chugging. Um, I, you know, I think this year was a really tricky period where you saw, you know, we had the COVID trade on us and this was probably the first year where we saw generalists do better than specialists. A lot of capital flowed out of you know, small and mid caps um, and into large cap names. Um, you know, we saw a great deal of enterprise value uh, creation, um, but there were definitely some meaningful setbacks. Uh, gene therapy had a major setback this year and then got a green light you know, from FDA back in September. But um, I think you know, things are continuing to innovate and innovation is accelerating. So I think 2020 is going to be a good year. Great. 
you said something interesting. You said generalists are better than specialists. What's what's the um, what do you think is the rationale for that? Well, I think I think you know I think a number of folks played in in Moderna and you know bought into uh, a lot of the COVID uh, you know vaccine developers and their therapeutic developers, and so I think you know they benefited by just a lot of capital you know buoying uh, those those companies. Um, which is usually not the case. <laughs> Scott, what, what are you saying for the IPO market? Yeah, I mean, we're, I agree. We're super excited about 2022. I think there's been, there's been a huge amount of very positive developments and it feels like folks are just waiting for 2022, right? So um, it's not officially confirmed, but it seems awfully credible that um, Bob Califf will be con uh, confirmed as the next commissioner, very industry friendly, very known. Um, I think it's a very, very big deal that the sentiment around biotech has changed. We'll see if this um, holds up, but right, it's one of the most popular talking points in Washington, D.C. is drug pricing. Right? It's, I think it's one of the only issues on the planet that you know, Democrats and Republicans can agree on. It's awfully hard to criticize you know, drug pricing uh, out of one side of your mouth and you know, be thankful that Pfizer has both a pill and a vaccine that is essentially saving the planet. Uh, from a pandemic. So if that continues or not, we'll see. Uh, but we're super optimistic that it will. I think the sentiment has changed and that's a big deal. And um, I think there's a huge amount of pent-up demand for 2022. Folks are kind of waiting for that. The, the, the one thing we are monitoring is that seems very consensus for companies. I think, you know, from banks, we've been told the queue of a um, of number of companies that are preparing to go public in January. I, it's bigger that you know I've ever seen in my career. So I think the biggest challenge for folks is actually just going to be competing for attention. But in terms of the sentiment and the market and all that, uh, at a at a broader level, at a sector level, I think will be very very exciting, very very positive. What about December? Are people going to are you say people are waiting for January? Or do you see people trying to get out in December? Or is everybody just waiting at this point? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be hyperbolic and say everyone. I'm sure there'll be the, the one-off IPO here and there. But largely, we've heard, you know, folks are just waiting for January. I think there's a lot of specialists that are down for the year and kind of um, just sort of saving dry powder, right? Not taking any risks, waiting for January. And um, I think that's going to be great for a lot of folks. But I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of who gets the attention and, and who's not able to. So yeah, we'll see. Travis, what are what are what are you, are you expecting the same or? Yeah, I would say um, obviously it's you know Q1 of this year was pretty unprecedented, and so if we have a repeat of that, I think uh, I'd be surprised. But um, but I, I'm I'm hearing much the same. You know, many of my uh, friends and colleagues who run run small biotechs are. You know, have S, have the S ones uh, tucked in already. I think um, you know one consideration that you know as we go into the new year is obviously in 2020 we had a lot in 2021 we had a lot of action in SPACs, and I think we're seeing a, a shifting focus of the way that vehicle is used. Um, but um, you know, and I think we'll I, I suspect we'll see less uh, sort of straightforward vanilla deals for companies that could otherwise IPO. Um, just given what happened in Q3, but um, you know, I think you know it's it's up for debate. I think there's opportunities to use that vehicle in a different way. But on that, I mean, do you, like I've seen um, is is one trend you're seeing? What kind of trends are you seeing? For example, one thing I've heard about is instead of I say a lot of times early on, SPACs were companies that had already tried to do a crossover couldn't, so they came back as a SPAC. So that was a little bit of a, a tired, you know, a tired thing to come back with. Whereas um, now people are looking at, um, you know, may, even putting assets together, you know, um, company, you know, putting assets together and then bringing them out as a new, pro valuing them properly, using their expertise and then bringing them out together, which seems like a much more bespoke and rational way to make a, a SPAC a real product. Um, are you seeing that or are you seeing other, other what you say, it's been, the, the way it's being used has changed. What other changes are you saying? 
Yeah, I think I think the perceptive amicus um, caritas deal is a good example, right, of something innovative. Um, one of the challenges, obviously, is how you get audited financials for the last two years, right? And that's sort of something that people are working through. And obviously, the SEC um, uh, has been very thoughtful about the way they approach SPACs in the in the in you know in the last few months. So I think we'll have to see how that you know, the regulatory aspects play out. But I think it's it's a good point. One, one of the things that strikes me is that this is a vehicle that, you know, you can, assuming you don't have redemptions, which is one of the critical things that, that, that's causing a heartburn right now, um, that, you know, you can put together a larger quantum of capital, you know, than you could probably in a traditional IPO with a pipe, obviously, alongside. Of course. S Steve, what are, what are you seeing for 2022, um, either for IPOs or, or in the, the lead up? Yeah, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to see a very frothy environment. We've already seen $21 billion invested in digital health this year. I mean, it's the biggest year we've ever had. I don't think that pace slows down. Um, I think the SPAC market is not dead. We had 89 SPAC IPOs last quarter. It wasn't 298. We had Q1, but it's not <laughs> dead. Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a lot more discipline around valuation. We're going to see conditions change. Timelines are tightening up. Um, sponsors are having to put more money in. I, but I think you'll see the SPAC market. What I'm more interested in is the M&A market that all of our portfolio companies are facing because you've got 53 healthcare SPACs running around out there that have a fuse lit that have to find an exit. Um, that's going to continue to drive the valuations we're seeing and, and a very active market. We have 10 portfolio companies right now going through some kind of process. We've, in our 30 years, we've never had that kind of activity. So I, I think that'll continue. Well, what about um, valuations? Um, you know, valuations have been pretty intense. Um, do you see do you see that continuing as well? I mean, it, it is, are we not just gonna see volume, we're gonna continue to see eye popping valuations? I'll throw that to Travis if <laughs> you wanna start. Yeah, of course. I think um, <clears throat> it's it was a frothy year, and certainly, um, yeah. I, I think w one of the reflections I have is is as we look into January and see how companies perform. I think there'll be a you know there'll be a new uh, class of companies that come that comes out. I think the performance of those companies will create a ton of new marks for for private rounds, and I think you know. A number of folks more on the crossover side that I'm talking to are, are very sensitive to that. I think a trend that we're, we're monitoring, and I'm very curious to see how entrepreneurs and banks and all the relevant players deal with, is for the last few years, gravity has been entirely inverted, right? The, the <laughs> worst thing on the planet you could have done to go public was have clinical data, right? In all seriousness, because hopes and dreams are much, much easier than developing drugs. Developing drugs is super hard, right? So it, gravity can only be inverted for so long. And what year it flips back, if that's in January, if that's in you know, the end of next year, if it's in five years, it's 10 years, I have no idea, right? I have absolutely no idea. If anyone on this panel has any idea, you know, we have a job for you. Um, but how folks deal with that will be very interesting because I think you know there's been a there's been a, a very brief market downturn in the last few months, right? IPOs in the beginning of the year you were automatically doubling on the first day of trading. Now it's not like that, but I think the thoughtful entrepreneurs that I've had the privilege to interact with, who have actually been through very dark times, who have been through you know who have been around the sector for 20, 25 years, you know they understand maybe it's not a billion dollar pre money valuation at your IPO for your preclinical company, but it's it's 600 million, 700 million. That's still an amazing accomplishment. And so how folks get advised and how they treat that will be very, very fascinating, you know, really interesting. Do folks still go? Do they want to stay private? Uh, I'm, that's one of the trends I'm really looking forward to monitoring in 2022. It's a good point, Scott, because, you know, you, you look at some of the companies and, you know, I think of a couple of companies that, you know, I, with my previous SoftBank hat on, shared with your portfolio that had clinical readouts and, um, you know, essentially there was no risk adjustment priced into, <laughs> into the company, 
right? And so, you know, the net effect is that, um, you know, either the entrepreneurs or the very early investors were the ones that accrued all the value there. And so um, I, I do think it's something that's going to change, but it's probably going to change on the back of some more failures. But we're also seeing, um, you know, a, a huge setback in the public small mid cap names. So we, I feel like over the past five years, really since, or, you know, since 2016, we've just kind of hit near all time lows um, for sector valuations and then sector would rebound and then kind of reach a peak of, you know, a historical average valuation and then get whacked again. And so we've kind of been bouncing up and down between lows and averages. And, um, you know, we're, we're back down to very uh, deep, attractive valuations. Um, in, I mean, yes, there are some pockets of fraud, uh, but we're actually excited to put money to work these days in in small in the small cap uh, public space. Yeah, in the venture space, we continue to see, for a company that has momentum, we're continuing to see incredible valuations. We're working on it. We're fighting to get into a deal right now. A company less than ten million of ARR and the pre money on it's going to be four hundred which, uh, you know, in our world, we, we all assume at some point that gravity does return and valuations come back down. So you've got to really believe your company is going to grow into that value before they run out of cash. Uh, I expect us to see a change sometime in the next year. It'll all go back to monetary policy and, and the broader market, I, I believe. Um, I think that is one of the things that, you know, a few of us have in common that we're doing more um, across cap structure, across, you know, stage of um, life cycle and, you know, doing more from company creation all the way to public investing. I think that's really important because there are distinct advantages that you get at every step along the way. Um, and then it's also more helpful for the companies themselves to know that, you know, if you're a private investor and you have the ability to continue to support them um, at the IPO and for follow-ons, um, that makes a huge difference. So I think we're, you know, we're finding and enjoying the benefits of, of that full life cycle investing. Stephanie, you brought up a really interesting point, which I totally agree with, is the valuations on the public side have come way back down. There's a huge amount of attractive um, and reasonably priced high quality public companies now. So we're actually allocating a lot more time to the public side. And what will be really interesting, and this is really how we advise our private companies, is if things continue to be tough, it's going to be a very much a world of haves and have nots. Because like Stephanie said, I, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth and I'm curious your perspective, but if things continue to come down on the public side, we're going to just spend more and more time there, right? And that will be really, really challenging for the, you know, the private companies that decided not to go, right? So if, you know, I'm, I'm again curious to see how folks behave of if the valuation isn't quite what they expected, they still go, right? Go, go talk to the folks at Sinesis 20 years ago who had the world's hottest crossover and were about to go public, but then didn't, right? And that ended up staying private for quite a long time. And it was, you know, a long famous biotech story at this point. So it's hard to remember that those environments exist, but it's possible. Um, and it's going to be really fascinating. It almost sounds like there, to a non-investor, it sounds like there's cognitive dissonance. Like the valuations are really high for the private side, then they go public and they come way down. Um, is it, I mean, is it something linear? Like they're going out before they have data, then they have data and they come down to reality or is it different types of, um, you know, the, are the companies in the public sector that are struggling, not in industries that are in, not in, in um, technologies that are as hot? I mean, what, why are, why are we overpaying at the beginning and then looking for bargains once they go public? I would say, you know, there is a class. So what, one reflection is there's a class of company right. that, you know, until recently was private, <laughs> right? That, <clears throat> yeah, I think you think about the Accentures or the recursions of the world, which uh, had a ton of momentum, had a ton of secular technology interest, right? And, you know, for all we talk about, um, you know, quantitative easing impacting our industry, 
I mean, look at, you know, look at what ha what's happening in, in companies that actually are P&L companies, not just L companies, like most of the companies we invest in, right? Um, there's sort of a, you know, the pool of possible investors just goes up exponentially. And so um, for companies that can cross that chasm, there's been a ton of private market froth. To date, actually, we, I've, been, I've been surprised you know, despite being at a tech fund for for a long time, at at the su success of those companies transitioning to public markets, but I think for a number of them there will be a, obviously a day of reckoning because they have clinical data that's reading out, and those data are gonna you know they'll they'll inherently color how people see the quality of their platform. So I think for now you're seeing platform type companies their technology focus being quite successful. And raising big chunks of capital and having large valuations, but I think um, you know it's it's it, the question is, is it the first inning here. I think we're also seeing there's there's a bit of exit fatigue happening in the private market. So given the number of you know the number of deals that are happening simultaneously, the banks are exhausted. And the private equity firms are all running flat out. So. Uh, if, if you've if you've timed your exit poorly and you're on the tail end of this process right now, you're gonna you're not gonna get the attention you probably deserve. And so that we're seeing some companies. Thankfully, we don't have that issue, but we're seeing some companies struggle to get attention from the bankers and from the PE firms because they are just exhausted. I think there's just a latency, and it's we see this every time, and it makes total sense because. Every time there's been a market dislocation in the last seven or eight years of this biotech bull market, it snapped right back, right? Sometimes it takes two months, sometimes it takes six months. And so if you're on the private side, I think folks have gotten very complacent looking at that. They say, well, you know, yeah, our valuation's high, but, you know, it can be much higher because look at all these public comps. And if it's hard for a little while, we'll just wait, you know? And for now, that's worked every single time. And that, that really drives behavior. So until that fact pattern changes, I just think the private markets won't, won't adjust um, unless the public markets stay depressed for a real extended period of time. I think there's also you know, an important point of the evolving landscape of the capital provider to private companies in our space. So there's definitely been a convergence of tech and biotech, so tech and science. Um, and I think we've seen new players enter the field, um, whereas RTW, you know, 80% of what we do is on the therapeutic side, um, about 20% is, you know, devices and, and diagnostics um, and tools. But we are very, very, you know, disciplined when it comes to writing checks for private companies. So. You know, there are syndicates and there are syndicates and, uh, you know, there are definitely, I think, areas where you'll see players that maybe are not recognized as, oh, yeah, these guys are in, they must have validated the science. Like there, there are a lot of sort of me too players and there's a lot more capital and there's an evolving landscape as well. So I think, you know, it's important to kind of know um, what drives your manager and, and what sort of the character of, of who is investing on your behalf. Um, what what's meaningful to them? So valuation for us is is always uh, has always been uh, critical and science. Would you say? I mean, if 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 you were if someone was advising a company, um, don't take the highest valuation if it's from a, a me too investor. Rather, take a lower valuation from a credible investor because it'll it'll set you up better. You're not going to get your bluff called later. I mean, for sure. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think you want to get into bed with, um, I think you want to marry sort of the best all around partner and someone that is not necessarily going to write, you know, the biggest check, but, um, you know, partner with someone who understands the needs and maybe it's not always dilutive equity investing. Maybe it's non-dilutive non capital and maybe it's bespoke or tailor-made things. Maybe it's licensing agreements. Maybe it's, you know, bridging and bringing, you know, a product into a new geography. So, 
I mean, I th there's so much that's going on today. And um, I know we've been very excited about looking globally at opportunities and the types of opportunities we see in China differ from what we see here in the, in the US. And, um, and we're, you know, we're, we're about to um, open up an office in London in the next, you know, sort of first half of next year. Um, we're very excited about that. And that opportunity set is also very different because um, there's wonderful science um, and a lot of those assets tend to get acquired um, by US acquirers, whether it's strategics or sponsors. Um, so we are very keen on trying to foster that investment ecosystem and build a crossover environment in the UK um, and broader Europe, because we'd love to see more of those products um, develop and stay homegrown. Stephanie, that for us, that really resonates as well as, as you know, we, you know, we've, we have two partners based in San Francisco, two partners and, and a, a large, larger team, much larger team based in London. And we're seeing the same sort of really high quality science. But I think you need to be on the ground and you need to be working as part of the ecosystem. But I do think that, you know, one of the unique things we're finding is we're able to provide sort of bridging quote, services to companies that we're that you know we're potential investors in where we can help them think about um, the US and think perhaps more like a biotech that sits in San Francisco or Boston about you know, how aggressive they are. Right. Are you guys seeing better at, um, since the crossover market there hasn't developed as much? Are you seeing the UK and Europe as you know to some extent um, more attractive valuations that to you know to technology with more attractive valuations, or are the valuations caught up to the U.S.? I, I would say they have not. I think um, you know there's always reasons for valuation gaps. One's geographic. One's you know the um, the depth of management teams. I think right. One's the the sort of arc and um, and. Uh, momentum aspects that some of these companies lack. Um, but <clears throat> you know, at least on the tech side, we're, we've seen that that arbitrage go away, right? And you know, when, I, when I speak to my growth tech investor friends who work in Europe, you know, FinTech is the same there as it is here in terms of you know, expanding multiples and the like. Um, so I think there's a question of how long that'll last. Now, naturally, um, you know, we're in a, we're we're in a sector that that's much more specialized, and so I think I think I think we'll continue to see companies that we can help grow in in Europe and the UK, um, uh, you know, and, and have reasonable valuations. So we um we like to call them free range companies, and what we mean by that is um, companies that didn't grow up in the kind of standard biotech venture capital ecosystem that we all kind of know and love, right? And there, it's not like one is better than the other. It's really not. Um, we just do, we kind of tailor the diligence appropriately. Um, when they're coming from the atlases and third rocks and RTWs and the super high quality tier one venture groups that do company incubation, you just, you, you know that it's all the best people in the world that are involved and the teams are there and they've had, you know, the very institutional support from day one. Um, and those valuations are often quite high though. Um, the free range, it's, it's often equally interesting science. It's just that, um, you know, they've kind of had to scrap it together often. And so really understanding who the people are is really, really massively important there, right? Because at the end of the day, this industry is so unbelievably hard to get drugs over the finish line and so capital intensive. It's all about people. And so that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, so for, you know, we, we don't have an office in London and things like that. So the biggest thing that we try to solve and hopefully the company from their side is trying to solve is, you know, do they come visit us? Do we spend time in person? Do we really get to know them and have deep relationships? And if that's the case, it's very, very easy for us to invest in those types of deals. Um, but there's kind of two different buckets of diligence associated with that. That makes sense. It's it's one thing I've noticed. It seems like the um, 
just increasingly every year, it seems like the sort of traditional hedge fund sector funds that you know originally were focused on the public markets and they started dabbling in crossovers. Now they're diving into crossovers. Then they were dabbling in earlier rounds. Now they're diving into incubating um, so that um, it's not always clear what the difference is between the, the hedge funds and the VCs anymore. Um, do you, is, am I seeing that correctly? Are you guys seeing that, are you, you know, the, the, at least the three, you know, two of you, they're definitely hedge funds. Are, are you seeing continuing more interest in, in actually incubating companies, not just investing later? Um, yeah, for, for us, uh, absolutely, that's the case. Um, and we've, you know, always actually organized our team in a way such that, so my background, I started out as an M&A banker. I worked at Lehman Brothers um, early in my career um, in New York and London, um, but we've always been very science focused. And so uh, our, our research team, you know, either come from industry or academia, and they look at science through, you know, one of several lenses, either a specific disease area where they have a specialty or through the lens of the technology that's um, addressing these diseases. And then through genetics and bioinformatics where we're looking at you know, identifying targets that we think are druggable. Um, so it's those three lenses that our, our you know, science-focused team looks through and they're agnostic as to whether you know, an opportunity is in a public company or a private company, it's about science. And then I think is, couple of things have happened over you know, the last half dozen years. One is our business has scaled um, meaningfully so that we, we can write checks and, and we can commit you know, for a, a longer period of time. Um, and you know, so we, we do have durable long-term capital. Um, and then the other thing is that the emergence and the explosion of genetic medicines, which has been an area that's been very important to us, um, you know, the majority of opportunities are actually coming out of private hands. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the combination of those two like enabled us to develop the similar type of, you know, high conviction around an earlier stage asset. Um, and we were willing to write more checks. So I think a, a few of us um, have, have done the same thing. We've gone from that public only into earlier, uh, you know, crossovers and then even earlier stage pilots. And I think it's smart. I think it's been an easier transition you know, if you look at the crossover um, development in the last decade, it's been an easier transition for the hedge funders to, to go early um, than, you know, some of the VCs to actually stay later. But we're seeing that now happen too, um, you know, with continuation funds and like growth capital funds and really just trying to capture more of the ecosystem, like in that, that middle section as well. So um, it's happening upstream, downstream across our sector and others. So you're saying you're seeing the VC investors start to look later as well, starting to, okay. Yeah, and develop, you know, purposeful, you know, vehicles to actually hold on to those, um, to those assets, because historically they've been under pressure to, you know, distribute as soon as a company goes IPO. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, like in our space, that, that is a very, that's a, you know, on average, like a $500 million market cap. Um, and some of these companies are, are hitting, you know, a few billion dollar market caps within a couple of years. So um, they're they're exiting way too early, and I think that's that's coming around to um, they're they're recognizing that it's not, you know, ideal. Do you, do you guys see VCs? It's one thing to hold on to your asset longer once you take it public. It's another thing to actually go in and say opportunistically go after undervalued public companies. Are, are you guys seeing, and Steve, are you thinking this way, are, are VCs looking at actually not just holding on to their assets longer in the public, but actually starting off with going, going off after um, public companies they think are undervalued um, that they didn't, they weren't involved with when they were private? Do you see, there's a little bit of that like in the crisis. Yeah. Yeah, I think it depends on your mandate. Um, what we are seeing is the, we used to be known as a series AB company. Now we're completely stage agnostic, right? So we did in our last fund, we did a seed round. We did a series A, two series C's, a billion dollar recap, right? So we were all over the place. Um, and you know, I think you'll see more venture teams doing that. And also depending on 
how long you hold something completely depends on the age of your fund, right? Um, you know, we were the first guys into Freesia and stayed through all the way through the IPO. And that was a uh, 17 year overnight success, right? Uh, when you're running a 10, 10 year venture fund. So you, the math is a challenge sometimes too. So that's why some, some VCs are setting up specific funds to do add on investments to uh, previous portfolio companies. And I think you're going to see more of that going forward. I would say, I'm, you know, we're certainly thinking about public opportunities, even on the asset side, right? Where you can put interesting private teams together with assets or technologies. And so, and I think we'll see more of that because um, a lot of really high quality uh, companies, assets, platforms, technologies are in the public markets now, right? Just by virtue of what's happened over the last two or three years. So, one, one topic that we've touched on a few times is the SPACs. Um, you know, we've identified some of, you know, it seemed like Q1 of this year, they could do no wrong. Um, then we started seeing the SPACs ha when they're trying to de-SPAC, having trouble getting pipes because who wants to buy in a pipe and get locked up, you know, and everybody else can buy in the private you're seeing. Then we started to see um, humongous redemption rates, 97%, 95%. Um, what do you, uh, what, what are you, what are you guys seeing people do to try to shore that, you know, what, what kind of things are, are, are SPACs doing to try to address those issues, either making sure they can get, um, you know, increase their chances of getting a good pipe together, um, decreasing redemptions, you know, are people putting together um, SPAC and in investor pools that are more fundamental investors? Um, you know, are they doing things after the deal to try to, to, to step into the shoes of, of funds that might redeem? What, 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 are, what, what are you hearing and thinking? I, and I think a lot of this is still in play, but what are you hearing in terms of strategies to deal with the issues, the, fundam the, the fundamental challenges of redemptions and, and, and selling pipes? I can maybe start and then we can let the folks with, with active SPACs speak. I mean, we, I've, <laughs> I've seen, seen a lot as of recently. I think, I think you'll, you will continue to see a retreat to quality. I think that um, uh, SPAC sponsors that are repeat, 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 repeat sponsors that have a lot of, uh, that are dedicated to the vehicle and that are dedicating time to the vehicle. I think about, you know, my, I've, a number of colleagues who, who are at the Gores Group, who now I think have done eight transactions of, you know, they just they just did um, Polestar, <clears throat> a carve out from Volvo, and you know that's a that's like a thirty to forty person team that's fully dedicated to the vehicle, and so you know I think you'll you'll see that, um, and you know their redemption rates, the variance in redemption rates is just as important as the, as the mean, right? So I think you, you'll see the, you know, those sorts of sponsors that are able to manage redemption rates because there are mechanical ways that they can do so and that they're very skilled at um, continue to win the day. Uh, I don't have anything terribly sophisticated to say. I'm, so we've, we've completed one SPAC and have an AFCO SPAC now. Um, and I'm super excited about the tool. I do think in this current, at least biotech, back market like i'm pretty sure if you had a cure for cancer you'd have redemptions and <laughs> I, I i our take on it is just to be patient right i think travis said it perfectly with what he started with it's just a retreat to quality right i think they've gotten a very bad name but it's a very obvious and probably predictable reason why right there was too many SPACs, and they were doing bad deals right bill i think you started by saying you know, we would see crossovers come to us looking for a traditional crossover. They couldn't get it done. And then we'd see it as a SPAC at 2X evaluation. It, it shouldn't surprise any of us that those don't do well, right? Um, so longer term, I'm super excited. And, you know, beyond just being patient and looking for the right deal. And I think if we bring an awesome, we take it as a mandate of, can we bring a deal to our peers? That's just awesome, fundamentally awesome. The stock process enables them to dig in a bit more than the traditional IPO process would. You can have a data room. You can really educate people, spend time. 
And I think if you bring a super high quality deal at the right price, I just think that that'll do well. It ends up at the same place. You are a public company, you know, with a quantum of capital and investors. So uh, I'm, I'm super optimistic about that tool as a toolkit. You know, we just need to flush out the, um, the negative selection bias we've seen in the last little while here. I think, I think you're, I think what you're going to see is, is it a quality sponsor with a great reputation who really knows the niche that they're playing in and the fundamentals of the business matter. And you know, what you're, what, what you're going to see, I think in the near term with the SPACs out there hunting uh, are, do I have to glue a couple companies together um, to get to the right threshold to be big enough to go public? And do the, does that new combined company make sense? And are the fundamentals healthy? I think it all comes back down to the quality of the business itself. And of course, the quality of the sponsors. Does, are there some companies, you know, you said one thing that was, I remember, I don't know, 10 years ago where some, some uh, creative kinds of um, like form 10 reverse mergers are being done with good companies. And one of the rationales was there are some companies that are b better sold by a private process than a, a public process. Um, and you just mentioned the advantage of people being able to do a deeper dive in a SPAC, which it's, I mean, they're both reverse mergers, so not surprising, right? They're bo bo both cases you're going public by means of a private placement. Are there certain, is one of the, you know, companies are always trying to figure out, should I be looking at an IPO? Should I be looking at a SPAC? Are there certain kinds of companies just by nature of um, the complexity of their story that even if they could do an IPO, they should think about going public by a SPAC because the process is better fitted for the best investors to really dive in and get, and get comfortable. Um, or is that silly because they could do that during the crossover process? I mean, yeah, I think also where we are in the market cycle, you know, depends and what the IPO window looks like and yeah. you know, how busy people are. And um, I mean, we, I feel like we contributed to that SPAC boom because we, our first SPAC that we completed, we did it in like, we announced a deal in five months. We were heading into another election year. Um, you know, we had a company that was ready to go and didn't want to deal with yeah, some of the uncertainties of, of going public in 2020. Um, and, you know, everything sort of played to our favor. We, we stacked, you know, we, we had a blue chip um, shareholder base many more fundamental investors. We didn't have any redemption, we had zero redemptions. So, you know, we made it look so easy. And uh, look, to what Scott said, I think um, it's absolutely a valuable tool in the toolkit. Um, but, you know, I, I think the, the sponsor market has been flooded with people who don't necessarily know what they're doing. Um, there's, there are very glamorous and attractive economics for sponsors who don't necessarily care if they do a great deal. Um, and then that's, you know, that that is going to force um, companies and then also investors to separate the, the wheat from the chaff. So um, I think there will be like a revert to, you know, high quality sponsors and good deals. Um, and there will be very few of them, relatively speaking. So. I think that makes sense. Steve, with with your portfolio companies, um, how do you how do you view SPACs as as um, I mean, are you are you are you is that something you look at occasionally, or is this something you want all of them to take a look at as they're approaching? Well, we have a lot of them getting approached by SPACs. You know, our our advice often is uh, pay attention to the sponsor. Pay attention to the fundamentals of your business. Um, sometimes it's better for a company to go through the traditional discipline of an IPO process. You know, they're just not ready. They're not ready to deal with public company um, reporting requirements and maturity. Uh, you know, we had a one of our one of our uh, investments, Dermtech, was a very successful DSPAC, molecular diagnostic for melanoma, um, and they've done very well. But um, it's less of a less because it was a DSPAC and more because you know they've been running the company well. 
And I think that comes back to, are you really ready to go through the process? Because I, I don't think it's a shortcut to going public as much as people think it is. In fact, I think you're going to see um, founders really think through, where do I, how do I want to exit? And is it really the right vehicle for me? Am I ready? And I think that's the advice that everyone has to be given and think through. Sense. For um, for European companies, you know, one thing I find when I'm talking to them, the the SPAC thing is kind of they're not really sure where the SPACs fit in. They're not sure um, about the crossovers. Um, um, what advice do you get? Would you give to UK companies that are starting to think about the US markets, but they don't already have a big US investor? Um, should they be looking at all these different things or should they be hiring an investment bank to help them navigate, you know, navigate trying to find U S investors. I mean, how, if you're a UK company, how would you approach getting into your world? I would say, <clears throat> obviously there's different entry points depending on um, where a company is in its arc. Uh, I think there are there are a number. You know, there's a lot of U.S. investors or tourists, and so um, you know, I think there are dedicated firms like our like ourselves and like RTW and others that are really making a, a concerted effort to be part of the ecosystem. I think the complexity of you know navigating SPACs um, uh, and you know versus IPOs is one that. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, a number of uh, you know us on the U.S. investor side of have, have scar tissue around navigating. <laughs> um, you know, there's certain there are certain sort of tax uh, tax implications, et cetera, about you know the the process of a SPAC that are that are relevant to certain European companies. So there may you know may be not as much of an option in some cases as I understand it as a result of that, but. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist by training, not a tax specialist. Although there, you know, there's similar types of uh, colonoscopy type things that, that tax specialists do. Um, <laughs> but um, but nonetheless, I would say, um, uh, you know, I think I think having a having the right set of investors who have um, you know have this sort of capital markets experience that many crossover and 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 growth stage U.S. investors have can be massively valuable, right? I think the biggest thing, the biggest piece of advice is do your homework as you look at companies you're approaching for money, because some of them won't, won't even look at you if you don't have any uh, revenue coming out of US based customers, right? So know that first before you spend a lot of time trying to find an investment firm and then understand who their syndicate is, who their investors are. Uh, because if, if, if you're trying to to line up and get payers to cover you, then you better have an investment firm that has payers as their LPs who can get you into their, their ecosystem, right? So do your homework and find the right investor that's, that fits with where you are in the stage of your business. One, one question from the audience, um, are US SPACs genuinely looking globally or are most going to be US, are most going to be US companies? And I don't think they mean U.S. incorporated. I think they mean generally SPACs. You know, SPACs generally um, are they? Are you guys? Do you think they're honestly looking for foreign opportunities as well? Uh, uh, we genuinely are. We very, very yeah. much are. Um, that's very, very genuine. My um, one of my biggest learnings from going through our prior SPAC was um, that. Certain entrepreneurs are right for the certain for different paths. I think um, we talked a lot. We talked a lot about we talked a bit about how in the SPAC process you can spend more time going through the science, really educating folks. But one of the great things about a SPAC is you can raise a lot more money that way, and that effectively does your crossover, your IPO, and your secondary potentially in one round. That process, which is a multi-year process for a new entrepreneur is actually awesomely important, right? Because you get to go kind of date crossover investors, get to build trust, like really meet who the players are. With our first back, the CEO was David Hung, who sold his last company to Pfizer for $14 billion. So he'd made public market investors $14 billion previously. So as soon as we got on the phone, everyone knew him. 
and he didn't need to go through that dating process. So it's less of a geographical thing to me and more of a, is, is this back the right tool for you? Because it's really just about securing you the, ca the capital you need to go, to go run and go fast. And you're ready to be a public company. You've done it before, you know how to do it. Or is it actually really, really valuable for you to spend the time, you know, getting on planes, coming, visiting U.S. investors, getting to know folks, things like that. So it's more entrepreneur focused rather than, um, you know, where the assets are geographically. Yeah, I think Scott makes a lot of sense. Um, we definitely look around the world for opportunities. So we, you know, we follow the science and it can, it can be unearthed um, anywhere. Um, but I really just think getting back to it, it doesn't, you know, the SPAC is, the SPAC has gotten a lot of attention, but uh, like, honestly, who cares? I mean, it's like one tool in the broader toolkit. I think the most important thing is how do you get companies um, and how do you help them advance their pipelines and how do you help get those, you know, magical drugs into the hands of patients? Um, and that's, I think, what we're all trying to do in SPAC, it's just like one way of getting, you know, a, a company public to tap into bigger, you know, future pools of capital. Um, but the reality is, you know, there are, I think that, you know, this group um, on my fellow panelists and, and I and others who are not here today, I mean, there's a small group of um you know, hybrid players that have a real strength in science where we look a little bit like the strategics and the drug developers, um, but a lot of skills um, as, you know, sort of the true financial players. So we're able to do more things, SPACs and reverse mergers and, you know, distressed and royalties and other kinds of um, creative financing solutions and, um, you know, partnerships. Um, so it doesn't really have to just be like a Pfizer coming in to say to the small biotech company, hey, we're going to, you know, help you commercialize in China or, you know, that that could be any one of us. Like it doesn't have to also be um, the Blackstone who's going to say, look, we're going to provide you with this type of capital or that type of capital or growth equity or whatever it is. That's also us. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think SPACs are, are just like one, you know, piece of a much larger mosaic. Yeah, I, I think from what I, I've seen, I mean, there are, there are actually some people that are forming SPACs and they're specifically trying to staff them with people that have connections abroad because they actually want to find global things. But I think to, to your point, even the ones that are formed like any Delaware incorporated U.S. SPAC, you're looking for the best company. You just don't care where it is. Um, and and I, so I, I don't think... Um, European companies should think that, that there's some kind of selection bias against them. It's, it, it's, I, I think the SPACs just want a good asset. They don't care where it is and they'll figure out how to, how to structure it. Um, it. It always comes back to the fundamental issue of product right. market fit and can you get adoption? I don't care if it's a digital therapeutic or a traditional therapeutic, it's, that's still the fundamental issue. Okay, great. Okay. Well, I think, um, I think we're at the end of our time and, um, and um, Josh, I'll kick it back to you. Fantastic, thanks, Bill. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I'm sure for everyone listening in, uh, so a real in-depth look there, um, lots of fantastic advice for, for uh, well, also just the companies. Um, so a big thank you to Travis, to, to Steve, Stephanie, Scott, and to Bill for guiding us through that session. Um, we uh, have our next session in, in uh, just uh, under six minutes or, or so now, um, focused on the Iowa One Health sector. So please do join us for that. Um, and uh, yeah, a number of uh, the people on the panel here will be uh, joining us uh, for our LSA World Congress in, in London in February. So um, please do uh, yeah get in touch if you want to get involved and, and join them and, and everyone else who's registered there. Uh, very much looking forward to, to seeing some people face to face uh, on this corner more widely. Um, but for now, thanks again to the panel. Um, thanks for, for all the insights and we'll uh, see you shortly at 4 p.m. In, uh, in the next session.